Rebecca Vandevoort. I'm the Associate Director of the Global Campus and Director of eLearning Services. And our eLearning Services is the pillar of the Global Campus that supports faculty using technology, whether for entirely online courses, for blended courses, for just little snippets that you think you might want to do in your classroom. And we are interested in the flipped classroom concept a lot for that reason. But that doesn't mean you have to use technology to flip your classroom. But if you want to use technology to flip your classroom, we're here to help. So I want to introduce um, our panelists. On the far left is Tom Dickinson from physics. Uh, next to him are Anna White oh, Abby Demirlier and Anna Whitehall. I always say them in the other order. And they're together here for HD 205. We have Dick Zollers from engineering. Jennifer Robinson from the College of Pharmacy, Sam Swindell from the Psychology Department, Joy Egbert from the College of Education, and Flipped Classrooms is at least one of Joy's primary areas of research. So she'll start off our presentation today talking about the research. Jenny LeBeau, who's also from the College of Education, and John McNamara from Animal Sciences. But to really get us started today, we're fortunate to have the Vice Provost, Erica Austin, to talk a little bit about the idea of flipped classrooms. Well, first of all, um, I don't know a thing about flipped classrooms, <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why I'm here. I'm also really excited about the idea of flipped classrooms, and I'm excited that you're all here. And I want to express appreciation to all of you on behalf of the Provost's office that you are here. You are the innovators. You are going to be the mentors to people like me who are kind of afraid of taking this step, who think it's going to be hard, uh, who think it's going to take a lot of time. But um, I looked at some of the background on our panelists, and if you look at what they have found, and as they're going to talk about today, um, what they have found is that it's not necessarily that hard, and that it's really well worth doing, and that, that it can make a tremendous difference. Um, John has said that it's actually made teaching easier for him, and Dick has said that it's actually improved student achievement in his class. And so this is really exciting news, and it's incredibly important. You may have heard, or if you haven't, I'm happy to tell you, that the Provost's Office is coordinating a university-wide effort on student retention and success. We know that one of every five freshmen who comes to Washington State University leaves after the freshman year. That is completely unacceptable. We have to do better than that. We're, we're not achieving our mission if students come here and are not succeeding. And it's not just after the freshman year that they leave. But, of course, a lot of them stay. A lot of them uh, succeed. But we want more of them to succeed. And we know that some of the reasons why students maybe don't succeed is because they feel a little bit lost either in large classes or on a large campus. And flipping classes is one way we can kind of change that around. Um, there's, there's some evidence for, which we're going to hear about that it really does make a difference. We also know that students come here because they want to achieve. They want to be engaged. They want a challenge. And flipping classes is another way that we can give them that kind of really challenging but rewarding kind of experience here at Washington State University. So, I'm not going to take much time because you want to hear from people who really know something, but I want you to know that on behalf of the Provost Office, we are really, really grateful that we have such innovators here um, to lead the rest of us along in what we really need to do and what I think will be very rewarding for us to do in pursuing things like flipped classes. So thanks very much for inviting me to say a couple of words, and I'm going to turn it over to the panel. So we're going to start with uh, Dr. Egbert, <clears throat> who's going to talk about her research. Um, she'll have about 10 minutes, and then each of the panelists, well, Abby and Anna are a team. So each of the courses gets about five minutes. They'll talk about just real briefly what they've done. They've also provided um, in the flipped classroom model. We tried to prov provide to everybody who'd registered some information up front so that you could prepare with questions. So about the first hour, we'll be taken up with the presentations. And then we'll have an hour for just open questions and conversation. And Besides the group that we have here, I just want to point out we have about 10 people um, at a distance that we're streaming live, and they'll also be 
bringing in their conversations and questions, and Theron DeRosier will be uh, monitoring that. And I would like to take just a minute to introduce my team. Uh, Charmaine Wellington is at the sign-in table. Theron DeRosier on the uh, computer there. Susan Fine is right back there, and Margie Fotopoulos back in the corner, and they are the e-learning consultants for the global campus who work with faculty who are using technology in their courses. And then Brian Mackey is our media guru who's made all this able to stream. So I will turn this over to Joy. One of the things I'm not going to talk about is not going to say in our research, in our research, because you know we've done a little bit and there's not a lot more. So what we've done, um, and David Herman is our TA for the course that we flipped, and he's working on flipped instruction for his um, dissertation. And uh, so I'm going to go through some of the things that we've learned kind of across the literature. First, this is not flipped instruction. Okay, if this is what your classroom looks like, it's a problem. Okay, and we can come, can you see that? It's upside down? You're supposed to laugh now. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, a lot of people actually don't know what flipped instruction is, and it's problematic for me because, you know, when the term constructivism came along, no one understood what that was either. How many people now can give me a one-sentence definition? No. Same with oh, one person, Rebecca. Okay, we'll talk about that after because I need that. Um, so a lot of people uh, have different definitions of flipped instruction. So we're going to go with kind of what is accepted across the literature. So the basic generic definition is instructional strategy in which direct instruction occurs outside of the classroom and interaction happens within. Okay, so that's easy enough. And so direct instruction is usually understood as lecture, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Okay, sometimes it's here's the worksheet, fill it out, th those kind of things. Let's take, this is the best video, it's four minutes, but it's worth it. It's the best video I found to describe flipped instruction. Oh, after this. Okay, sorry. Um, actually, I stole this from the internet, but I can't remember from who. Sorry, it's there. You, you can go find the attribution if you need to. So this is what actually flipped. I, it could have been Bergman and Sam's, I'm not sure. Um, so it, it actually means something. It's not just flip like funk. So it integrates these things. Okay, you can get this on, it's just search for my Prezi and you can get it. Okay, so now it should be the video. No. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so why, for me, flipped instruction is not new. In, in, in fact, Tom Dickinson invented it in the 1960s, I'm pretty sure. But aside from that, um, what we do in our classes all along is students do things outside of class. They look at videos or they read or whatever they do when they come to class. We help them understand how to apply those concepts, how to make language objectives, how to connect learning to students' lives. So my preferred way to talk about flipped instruction is that it's resource-rich, student-centered learning supported by technology because it makes more sense. And we've done this forever, starting with the pencil, chalkboard, whatever it is, right? So it's not really something new. Okay. A lot of people don't really understand what student-centered means either. We have all these terms we throw around about flipped instruction or about instruction in general, but we, we're not always talking about the same thing. So here's an understanding, one understanding about what student-centered means. Who chooses? That's all it is, who chooses? The more that students choose, the more student-centered it is. Okay, you're doing a way better job than I am. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can get this video going. Misconceptions around what the flip classroom is, what the flip classroom is not. So, rather than discussing what the flip classroom is in my practice, I'll discuss a list that most flip classroom teachers can read. The flip classroom is not. So, let's get started. The flip classroom is not the Khan Academy. While the Khan Academy is an excellent resource for use in and out of the classroom, the flip classroom is special because classroom teachers create the videos to suit their students' needs. We want students to be active in their learning, not droids sitting in front of screens getting lectures with someone halfway across the globe. The videos are an extension of the teacher and help create a strong relationship between student and teacher. The flip classroom is not a replacement of teachers. This couldn't be further from the truth. In the flip classroom, the role of the teacher is more important than ever. There's no sitting at the back of the class reading the newspaper and having coffee. This is as much as I'd like to sometimes. In the flip classroom, the teacher is active all day. Teachers get a chance to work with every student, every class. 
Foot classroom is not all about the videos. Yeah, videos are the backbone of the foot classroom. Today I'm hoping one of these days produce a video that goes viral, or perhaps appear on Ellen. However, it is the flexibility the videos provide that is a true benefit. Teachers now have additional classroom time where they can develop rich learning activities to extend their students' experience. The foot classroom is not the silver bullet. The foot classroom does not solve all that is broken in education. If it did, I'd probably be filthy rich. It's just one tool to increase student learning. Inflexibility, lack of classroom time, and student-centered classrooms problems that I feel the foot classroom helps solve. The foot classroom is not a one-size-fits-all teaching approach. Each foot classroom teacher develops an approach that works for them and their students. As an example, some teachers have students watch the videos in class. Some students watch them at home, in a car, or on a bus, on a plane, straight into a Dr. Seuss book. And some even get the students to create the videos themselves. The limits of the flip classroom are only as limited as the teacher's imagination. The flip classroom is not top down. The flip classroom is 100% driven by teachers. For the model to be authentic, it needs to be initiated and created by the teacher for the teacher. How often have we attended a staff meeting and presented with the newest flavor of the week to never give it another thought? The foot classroom is a flavor teachers want to do because they believe in it. And it's delicious. The foot classroom is not a teacher holiday. The foot classroom is anything but a holiday. The amount of time that goes into creating quality videos and activities is second to none. In the classroom, teachers are no longer spending time lecturing. Instead, they're constantly interacting with their students, inspiring, observing, and as we all know, sometimes the product. The foot classroom is not easy. Students have been in the traditional model of school for their entire educational career. They like playing school. Some of them are very good at it. Now that we want them to play learning, it can be a tough pill for them to school. And lastly, the foot classroom is not all about students watching videos from home. It's about students using videos when and where appropriate for their learning journey. Many my students find that they use their classroom time so effectively they rarely have homework. Believe me, they love this. Now they have time for things that truly matter to them, like Twitter and Facebook. Okay, so as you can see, there's a lot of variety in what people understand is a flip. So if we talk about, if we use that term, then it kind of puts us in a box that we don't want to be in when it comes to instruction. So how does it work? As I said before, um, direct instruction happens outside, and there are lots of ways for that to happen. Um, our assistant pro associate provost said that we didn't need videos, although most people use them, but there are texts, photographs, all kinds of different things that can deliver direct instruction outside of class. And then inside of class, people are doing all kinds of things. Sometimes they're doing the same activity. A lot of times they're doing centers or group work or other things. But the most important thing is that they're critical thinking and there's active participation, active being the key word. You read my wine. <laughs> okay. So the research, research so far, which is mostly anecdotal, teachers saying, well, I really love this because, shows that sometimes flipped instruction provides better, more effective learning, that students can get improved grades, that it can or may increase student engagement. Um, because students are engaged, there's, there are far fewer disruptions. Test scores may go up and student needs could be aligned better with the school resources. Okay. A lot of issues because it's new in the way that we call it flipped instruction. For example, someone asked, what's the difference between flipped instruction and a regular grad class? Well, so you give your students this big book and say, go read chapter 25 and summarize it and bring the summary to class. Oh, sorry. <laughs> For, for a lot of our students, that just doesn't work. They're international students. They don't have a lot of background. They don't understand the vocabulary always. So we need to give them some resource-rich, remember that's my definition, resource-rich um, direct instruction. So we need to provide them with other kinds of videos. We need to provide them with maybe pictures of something, synopses, different websites they can go to to check the information, um, or uh, conversations maybe on a blog where people have talked about chapter 25. That's a lot different than just sending them home with the text. So we're giving them um, different kinds of support. And then when they come to class, <laughs> it's not just one student or the teacher standing in front saying, this is what I understood from this chapter. Right? And the other student's going, oh, when am I going to be able to check my email? Right? Um, no, that's OK. So again, another question, does every lesson have to be flipped? 
Um, we did flip every lesson in our class, but it doesn't have to be that way because it's only one class out of six that the students take during that semester. So it's not kind of every day all the time for them. But you can choose whatever lessons are, are most useful or um, flipped instruction is most useful for or most relevant for or that the students would get the most out of. So when people say, oh, I got to flip my classroom. I have 40 videos to make and whatever they do, it's not necessary. Flip a couple, see how it works. If it doesn't work for your students, then don't do it. Okay, how much time does it take? Um, one person said success is in the preparation. It takes as much time as you want it to. Our first trial um, for our class, we made PowerPoints and then talked over them for um, our videos. Yeah, we're working on that now. Um, so, and it did take us a lot of time because we had to decide what do we want the opening screen to look like, how are we going to put quizzes in them, where are we going to post them so students can access them. Um, but once you get started and kind of say, oh, here's the idea, here's the kind of format that students really like, then it goes much more quickly. Of course, it would be great if the global campus could get funding for a, just a video production lab that we as teachers can go in and use to make our videos, much easier than using the equipment in any way in our college. What tools? Whatever is accessible and appropriate. So if you don't have the video camera, Use whatever camera you have. Um, if you don't know how to make videos, have your students, like we're going to do this semester, we're going to say, here's the old videos. We know you don't like these. Make new ones. And so they'll make them in the format that works for them, that appeals to them. Um, again, video is necessary but insufficient. The videos we made were, you know, I went back and looked at them and I almost fell asleep. So um, there's some choices. For example, Click this, just, let's look at just a little piece. So Khan Academy, you probably know, right? Move the four over the six. The language of English language arts. Let's first talk about some aspects of it. So this is the format of our current videos. And it goes along with the text. Okay, let's, let's yeah. Okay. This is what I've been told students really like. Here's an idea. Minecraft is the ultimate educational tool. Okay, so the idea here, this is source fed. Okay, turn off. It's much more of the way that our younger students, undergraduate students, watch videos. And I'm thinking that that's the kind of videos that they're going to end up with at the end of the semester, but we'll see. So it really matters. Um, if you want the videos to be effective, to think about what are your students' learning styles, what do they do outside of class every day with video. YouTube is generally not this, except for the videos about flipped instruction. <laughs> Next. Okay, ultimately what we want to do, actually I'm trying to write a grant if anybody wants to do this with me, let's, let's do it. We have a couple other people in the College of Ed to get our own video production room, green screen, and we can do lots of amazing things, especially with like health ed and science and that kind of stuff would be fabulous. So something to think about. Um, one of the questions that I've gotten a lot on the website is, okay, we get how to make videos and all that kind of stuff. What are we supposed to do during class? Really? Okay, well, um, can you help students learn to apply, synthesize, summarize, critically think about the material in some way? Here's some websites to go to to get those materials. Um, and so that's the most important part to plan the in-class time so that it's not wasted. And one thing to consider, and the research shows that students don't always like it, um, especially if you pop it on them like we did <laughs> and don't say anything about it and then expect them to know how to do it and to appreciate it more than other things that they do. So it has to be something that's eased in, that students understand why you're doing it, and that they have a voice in, as any other kind of instruction. And I was asked to provide one resource, and this is the Bergman and Sam's book. It's the, they're the kind of guys who said they invented it in the chemistry classroom. And so here's their book um, that has a general overview about two kinds of flipped instruction, uh, mastery and, what's the other one? Traditional. Like it could be traditional, <laughs> but okay. Um, so that's the resource. It's not based on research, other than research on what good teaching is.
Anything else? Uh, we have a website with our research papers. It's at the College of Education. It's called Flipped. So if anybody wants to look at those things. All right, thank you very much. So with that um, foundation, I think what we will hear today is about a number of different models and ways that these theories have been applied. Um, and so I'm just going to start here at the this end of the table and we'll move down and you each have about five minutes and I will wave in the back. I know how some faculty sometimes <laughs> like to pontificate. <coughs> Dr. McNamara. Thank you, Dr. Vandenborg. So I'll probably not talk a lot about the specific details of the classes, but um, go back to 1992 when I joined the Washington Science Teachers Association. And the first dinner we had at Hanford, sat down next to a lady, started talking about what she was teaching at uh, Renton High, and she was talking about all this great stuff that her students were doing and cloning bacteria and solving problems. And that night she earned the WSTA High School Teacher of the Year. Uh, Mary McClellan went on to lead the uh, charge for the new standards, uh, new textbook standards and those types of things. And working with those people showed me what teachers could be when they give a damn about each and every student knowing full well that a lot of the students don't want to be there. Now I've got the good luck of working in a very narrow area in animal sciences our students tend to want to be there, they're, they're highly involved, and so, you know, that's a little easier to do. But um, we all have different stories about what wonderful education we got in high school and college, and some of it was really, really good. One quick anecdote was I took the statistics class, flunk out grad level statistics class at University of Illinois from the guy that wrote the book. He walked into a room of 150 white men, turned on the projector and talked to his projector for the next 50 minutes. He never made eye contact, he never asked a question, he never answered a question. And I changed that day. I'm never gonna do that. So the thing about making it easier, I kinda lied a little bit, what it actually does is free you from the idea that you have to be on, you have to provide perfect information, you have to you know, be ready to lecture three days a week, five days a week, all the time. It certainly doesn't save you tremendous amount of time, I don't think, but I can say from um, my own students now for about 15 years in AS 464 and 10 years in uh, AS 205, which is a general education biology course. So that course is open to all majors and it has no prerequisites. So I've got everybody in there from the gung-ho, I'm going to be a veterinarian, to the business major that hasn't taken their biology credit and I want to graduate this semester. You, you do have the common um, interest of pets, of animals. So again, it's a little easier that way than having someone sitting through a prereq course that they may not really like. But, but nevertheless, working in that class really gave me the opportunity to see different learning styles. I knew that just lecturing to people, some of them that hated science, didn't understand science, didn't know what it was, to try and get them to understand the concepts of nutrition and care of animals, on an emotional and on a scientific basis, it really gave me the opportunity to have them grow and have them learn and work with different people. So some of the, I think some of the techniques, group problem solving, and I know Dick's gonna talk more about that. Again, you talked about students not liking it. A lot of them hate it. I tell them straight out, and this is what I circle, this is reality. If you think you're gonna work alone all your life, you don't have a clue. You have to be able to solve problems and it's not just looking it up in a book. So then we'll come in and we'll do some mini lectures and do some, some norming to make sure that they are actually are getting it right. One of the things is that I still give exams. I made that mistake, especially in my senior class. You don't get exams, the majority of them won't do the work. So there's lots of different assessments. It doesn't have to be a traditional exam as far as that's concerned. 
So, so with that, I think it's just a little bit of background of why. Again, we've had an introduction. There's all sorts of different kinds of technology. Probably the piece of technology that I use the most is the internet because we're very heavily content-based and they can go out there and you've probably all done it. You type in dog food, okay? And you can get every kind of website you've ever wanted and you know that type of thing. So for the higher level classes, you know, PubMed, Google Scholar, where they are used to going out and getting that information. And then again, our job becomes, well, did they truly critically understand it? Okay, so could they go out and read an article of any kind and then come back and discuss it with the group and then have me sitting there, and I'm not reading the paper, but I am usually drinking a cup of coffee. And as they go down the wrong track for a while, I can start bringing them back. So, so that's really helped me. Uh, I would like to get more into some of the specific technologies. Um, but again, I think that's a tool. Uh, the whole idea about getting the students engaged in their own education, getting them to own it, getting them to understand. And, and one last bit that I, that I mentioned in here before I pass it on, you know, part of the whole change deal is, is having good information to convince our colleagues that this is a bona fide, improved form of instruction that doesn't dumb anything down, okay? We're not just pandering to students who like to watch videos. That's not what it's about. When, as you mentioned, it doesn't, you know, the specific thing doesn't have to be every day. So I think as we move forward as a university, we're going to have to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with people showing them that, 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 you know, we can do this. So that's mine. I hope there wasn't more than five minutes. <laughs> Okay, um, so the class that I teach is Ed Psych 570, which is Introduction to Program Evaluation. Um, and the course is designed to be um, content knowledge based as well as practical application because trying to teach evaluation by just reading textbooks doesn't really work. Um, so the course just historically has already had this application component to it. Um, the course is offered from 5.10 until 8 p.m. on Wednesday nights. So we automatically have, a, you know, everybody's tired, hungry, um, so trying to boost engagement is sort of a big deal for this class. Um, the way that it's been structured in the past is we've had, um, we've, I've had the class from 5 until 7.30 at night, and then we <clears throat> cut out the break so people can get out early um, just to kind of help with that. But one thing that I found in teaching, doing it that way last year, is there's just not enough time to cover everything that I want to cover in the class. Um, you'd think with three hours that would be enough, but there's just a lot of material. Um, so this year I decided to try uh, what I call a modified flipped classroom. I was actually hesitant to even call it that because I really didn't do much other than um, I took my lecture slides and I put them on the Angel LMS site and um, told students that they were responsible for reading those lecture slides and gaining the material that way in addition to the reading that they already have as well. Um, so I was trying to move that piece of it out of the classroom so that then I would have a little bit more time within the classroom. Um, and that part of it worked really well as far as offering more time. Um, so now what we do, we meet from 5 until 7, um, so just two hours, which is a little bit more tolerable um, than the three-hour time period. And instead of doing an hour of lecture at the beginning of the class, which I did last year, now this year I spend the first part doing a Q&A discussion. So on also um, in addition to the class was on the AMS website, there are students are required to post a question from the reading and then also to respond to someone else's posting. Um, and the idea behind that was to help increase the engagement out of the class and what I was hoping would happen with that is to have an ongoing dialogue so that we'd have different levels of interaction with the materials. So we'd have this Q&A where people, you know, students would be able to converse back and forth about what they're learning and then they would be able to come into the classroom and we would talk about it during the Q&A session. Um, and sort of add to their understanding in that way. And then we have, for the last hour of the class, we do an application. So it's also a teamwork-based course. Um, they work in teams and do a class project throughout the semester, which is how they learn evaluation. Um, 
but so we still we have that last hour then for application and so far it seems like it's worked pretty well um, as far as assessments go I I did a quiz um, last week and I was we didn't really have a very good response rate people didn't quite pick up on some of the content um, that I was really hoping which tells me that I'm just not um, I, I need to work a little bit harder at trying to incorporate the content part of the course and find a way to still get those connections made that need to be in there. Um, but a lot of it's just learning. You know, this is my first semester of trying it. So um, one thing I'm going to do for next semester is try to, or I guess it's next year, um, is try to actually record some videos, which now mean, I think I'm going to have to make them a little spicier than I was planning. <laughs> um, Lab. Oh, good. OK. Yeah, let's work on it. Um, anyway, so trying to put some con some verbiage with the slides, because just reading through slides, you get a little bit, but it's not really, you know, it's not overly helpful. Um, so adding that component and then trying to find a way to incorporate some other assessments or something to kind of make sure that we're getting the knowledge throughout the semester. But I think overall it's working well, and I've had pretty positive feedback from students. Um, and. I think that's about it for now. I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Uh, the, I'm going to actually probably say many of the same things that Jennifer said. The course that I teach is Psych 491, uh, 591. It actually is a conjoint undergraduate graduate course. Uh, I'm flipping for the first time this semester, so it's actually only the undergraduate component that I'm attempting the, the flip in. This course typically enrolls juniors and seniors. Uh, it's, it is a content-specific course, and typically the content is fairly challenging for students. Uh, there's a strong emphasis in application, because I think that just understanding the principles don't help them a whole lot if they can't use that material. And Certainly, another important learning goal for me is to help them to think like a behavioral psychologist, which is also a fairly challenging learning goal because it's asking them to think about behavior in a way that's very different, I think, in many ways than how they're encouraged to think about behavior in many of their other psych courses. So for many students, it's a, it's a difficult um, transition for them. The course typically enrolls 120 students. It's been as large as 220. Uh, I had a unique opportunity this year in that we were looking at enrollments in July and it had 42 students. And so I thought that this was an opportunity to try a flipped arrangement, which I'd been sort of considering for a while, but like maybe some of you and maybe like some of the panelists, was I just was intimidated a bit by it in a really large course. Um, and I'd been trying to make my lectures as interactive for years using things like clickers. I'd been to workshops for, say, the Pogel approach and I just, I hadn't ta taken the plunge, as it were. So I have 42 students. I can't miss this opportunity. So what I decided to do was ease into it. I've actually, I'm only using flipped arrangements on about half of my class sessions. Uh, this summer, I audio taped PowerPoint lectures. So basically, the PowerPoint that I would have presented in class, I created audio or narrated versions of the of that, I had a little bit of experience having worked with Global Campus in the past. So I prepared those over the summer. I post them on the ANGEL um, course website or course site. So students access that in preparation for a, a flipped session. So they have to listen to the audio lecture. They have to do some reading. Then they have to come to class with um, what I call a feedback form, in which I instruct them to give me three insightful questions. I want two about the the reading that was assigned to you for this particular class, whether it's the reading or the audio lecture. And in addition to that, the third question can be something that we're just talking about in class that's relevant to the course. They have to turn those in at the beginning of that class. At that point, I give them, I break them into groups. I give them a structured learning exercise that in some ways follows a little bit of the Pogel format, if, you've, if you're familiar with Pogel, which means that it starts with sort of you ease them in. You sort of start with, let's start with some easy definition questions, and then we get, a, and, and as they move through the exercise, you're trying to move them sort of through Bloom's taxonomy in, in a way. Um, while they're working in groups on the structured exercise, I'm reviewing the feedback forms, looking for common themes that are showing up, what was unclear about the material, um, what might I need to additionally clarify in class. Um, and that is working fairly well. You, 
themes typically pop out um, across those, uh, those feedback cards. They'll work for about 25 to 30 minutes. I'll be working the room after I've reviewed the cards, see how the groups are doing. Uh, sometimes I'll instruct them to stop at a certain point. We're going to regroup. We're going to come back as a class, discuss, okay, what are your answers? Sometimes I have them working on all of the same things. Sometimes they're doing different things. Um, so maybe groups one, two, and three, you're going to work on this set of questions, and then you're going to come up, send a, a member of your group to the board, and I want you to put down your answers, and then we're going to talk about who, who seems to have the right answer and why. Um, and, and then at the end of that, the flipped class, they turn in what I call the master form. So the group has to submit uh, a, one of the structured exercise handouts with the answers that they've worked on, which they get points for. They also get points for the feedback forms. Uh, I don't really grade those in terms of accuracy, but it's more just a way to motivate participation and make sure that um, you know, they're engaged in the activity. I have to say, I've been incredibly encouraged. My students have been fantastic. I feel like I told them on day one, we're gonna try this, it's my first time. Uh, it's maybe a little rough, but they've been totally willing, I've, I've felt, to, to jump in the deep end with me and, and, um, and really work. So I have to say that I'm, I'm very excited and I think I'm, I'm willing to, to, to go all the way uh, next time I teach the class next fall. So that's been my experience. I'm Jennifer Robinson, I'm from the College of Pharmacy, and I promise I don't always sound like this. So I'm going to limit my comments, one, so I don't completely lose my voice, and so I don't grate on anybody's nerves completely. So I'm from the College of Pharmacy, and this is my sixth year with the College of Pharmacy. Uh, for a number of years, I've been teaching the Applied Patient Care course, where students, we really want to push them to apply information and think higher level um, think at a higher level. And so my first few years of teaching, my first three years, I would come to the end of the year, I would scrap everything that I was doing because I was so frustrated because I felt like the students weren't learning. I would assign readings and they would come to class and I felt like they weren't completing the readings. So I would spend my class time recovering the readings while they were checking their email or they were on Facebook. So I got really frustrated. So I heard about this new theory, new to me, wasn't new at the time, team-based learning. So team-based learning is a uh, iteration of a flipped classroom and it's very structured. So uh, six or seven times during the semester, my students get a quiz in class. That quiz isn't based on anything that I've taught them in class. It's based strictly off the readings. And that quiz builds into their final grade. Um, and all of the quizzes are based off of clear objectives from the readings, so it's very clear to the students what the expectations are. After they finish taking that individual quiz in class, they then have to take the same quiz in a team. And so if you guys know anything about motivation, peer pressure, Students do not want to look like they don't know the material, especially pharmacy students, in front of their peers. So they will work their fannies off to make sure that they understand the readings, they understand the basic concepts, and come to class prepared. So all of a sudden, I had these students who were coming to class. They did the readings. They understood the material. And then they would start challenging my quiz questions. Well, in the reading, it actually said this, and I interpreted it as this, so I think you should give me that quiz point back. And then we would have this discussion within lecture, or within tutorial, and um, so I had a group of 100 students, and they were in teams of five to seven. I thought, wow, these quizzes are really powerful. That wasn't the powerful part. The powerful part was when they moved on to the application exercises. When I took these students and I moved them up balloons, where I put them in groups and we started talking about these concepts to a higher level. I would give them cases, I would have them work through the cases, and then I would ask them, okay, do you think the answer is A, B, C, or D? And they would read through all of the answers. Sometimes two or three of the answers could be right depending on how they defended it. 
And so in class, I would have each of the team hold up a card to say what they were voting for, A, B, C, or D. And then um, I would go around the room and they would defend why they chose that answer. Why is that current therapy the best for a patient and why didn't you choose the other ones? So the students were applying the information that I later would expect them to do on an exam. The interesting thing that I found, the students who got most frustrated were my high performing students. The students who got least frustrated, who benefited the most, were those lower performing students. All of a sudden, they were understanding the concepts to a higher level. Those students who were just on the verge of not quite getting a concept were pulled up by their teammates. And you would think, okay, were their teammates frustrated by this, that they had to help su support this other person's learning? And really, they weren't. They were in the same teams all semester, and they worked as a community. Did it always work perfectly? No. Uh, did it take a lot of time to prepare? Yes, the first year it took quite a bit of time. When I rolled it into my second year, uh, during the first year I made some tweaks after every quiz and after all the application exercises. So when I rolled it out the second year, it was quite a bit easier. Something that I think really helped my students grasp these concepts and uh, embrace the team-based learning approach was I spent 30 minutes during the first tutorial to explain to them why I was doing it, how I was doing it, what my role was, and what their role was, so they had a clear understanding. I went from checking to make sure that every student had their homework done at the beginning of class to expecting that they got it done, and if they didn't, that was their own deal. And also, I used to take attendance, and I would always have students who were gone. Using team-based learning, I have very few attendance problems. Students are showing up, they're engaging, because they don't want to let their peers down. And quiz-wise, I have a fairly high-performing group. I saw no changes within quizzes. They didn't decline um, grade-wise. Something that I did see on my evals at the end of the semester, my performance evaluations actually went up which surprised me. I expected them to nosedive the first year, but the students really appreciated it. One other point. I have a course that's one credit uh, for pharmacy students who are taking a full load of 18 credits. And they, at the end of the semester, said that my class was one of the more valuable classes, and they remembered the information, and they knew how to use the information by the end of it. I guess I have a, a slightly different take on a lot of this. The course that I teach is a first semester sophomore level class in chemical engineering. Um, for the past few years, the enrollments have been going up significantly. I have 114 students in the class this year. And the reason I got involved in the class was if I took a look back historically in the en enrollments in the class, you have to get a C or better in order to continue on with uh, future classes in the curriculum. And 35% of our students were not making a C. So we were losing a third of our students the first class they ever took in the major. Uh, the class is all application. Uh, I can summarize the theory behind the class very easily. Mass is conserved, energy is conserved. Thank That's you. it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's it. It's all application. Think back to your first algebra class, and there was always that problem that said, train leaves station A on the track going, <laughs> da, da, da. that's all we do for 15 weeks. The students find it very frustrating that they can't go to the book and flip open and find the equation to use. It doesn't exist. Um, so I took over the class thinking, well, I can do better than 35% fail rate. You know, I, I can get that up. You know, so we get 70, 80 percent passing. Uh, my first four, three, four years, 35 percent of my students didn't make it. And I thought, there's got to be something different. The advantage I have is within the chemical engineering discipline, there are a number of people that have explored different uh, type of learning styles, uh, t learning techniques. And so I started uh, 
borrowing, I guess is a nice word to say, I stole all the information from a group at the University of Colorado. Uh, typically the lecturer in the class is the professor will stand up there and work an example problem on the board and then give a problem to the students and they will try and solve it and the professor will walk around to see what they're doing. My class is in Todd 216, 190 seats, fixed amphitheater seating. If you're in the middle of the middle row, I can't get to you physically. And with 114 students in the class, I can't get there. Even with the five TAs I've got, I just can't do it physically within the class period. So rather than work problems, I've borrowed uh, a number of video clips from the University of Colorado where they work problems. It's the bad example that uh, was shown earlier. This is just someone writing a problem out and explaining it as they go. But that's exactly what I would have done anyway. So I tell them, here's the reading for the next class period. Here are the video clips you should watch. When they actually come into the classroom, I basically do nothing but uh, clicker quizzes. And it's over the material from the book, over the material that they should have seen in the example problems. Um, Attendance, I have no problem with attendance because participation works and I don't have to take attendance. My usual uh, explanation to the students is if your clicker is not in the classroom and working, then you're not here. <laughs> and they, they find that very quickly. Um, the one thing on the uh, clicker quiz problems is they're all concept based. So they really require almost no computation at all. I guess the key factor in working the clicker quizzes, especially if you're trying to test concepts, is obviously the right answer has to be in there, but you have to have good d d distractors. Uh, I just had an example last, uh, two weeks ago now. Um, pose the question, the clicker responses came back. One of the things I will do is if I don't see a strong preference for the right answer, I'll re-poll the question, but now tell all the students, okay, talk with the people around you and see if you can't come to a consensus as to what the correct answer should be. This distractor was so good that the second time around, it got more votes than it did the first <laughs> time around. But as a teaching moment, it was great because now I could go in and say, okay, here's the point you're missing. And that's really what my time in the classroom is spent doing now is we'll do the quiz. If everyone gets it right, there's no point in doing any further discussion about it. We'll go right on to the next question. If I find one where there is an agreement, I'll ask for the repolling. If everyone comes up with it the second time around, then I'm assuming that all of their peers are helping the ones who were picking the dis detractors, distractors, um, and getting them online. If everyone is missing it, then it's time for me to step in and intervene. So that's basically what my class has become over the last two to three years. Um, the one thing that I think maybe some of my colleagues find a little bit intimidating to do that, when I walk into the classroom, I have no idea where the lecture is going to go for the day. Questions that I think are going to be a real challenge for them, they find right away. Things that I think are going to be simple just absolutely stump them. And so I have no idea what I will actually be doing in the classroom on that given day. Um, as far as student acceptance, last year was the year, first year I really fully flipped the class and I got probably the lowest teaching evaluations I've ever had. And the comments were Dr. Zollers didn't teach us anything. And so when I started the class this year I said, the purpose of this class is not for me to teach you something. The pur pur purpose of this class is for you to learn how to do something and it's your responsibility to do it. Um, hopefully that will make a difference. But the one thing I was able to tell them this year, that 35% loss ratio that we have had over decades, and it's not just unique to WSU. I talk with my colleagues, it's the same in this class everywhere. Last year when I fully flip, flipped the classroom, that was only a 20% failure rate. And so I told them, would you rather have a one in three chance of not making this class or only a one in five chance? And they all agreed the one in five sounded a whole lot better to them. <laughs> uh, 
the other thing that I am have done last year and I'm following up again this year, uh, working with a colleague in double and actually computer science, Chris Hunthausen. And we're actually starting a uh, actor in an investigation really this year where students submit homework assignments online. We can then send it to other students in the class anonymously and the other students in the class critique the solution that they see. They have to make a comment before they can see what the other people critiquing the solution have said. Then as a group they come to a consensus that's sent back to the original author who is then allowed to modify their solution. And so it's a way of getting group involvement without actually getting groups together. Uh, no one actually knows who the other people in the group are, um, but it seems to be working very well. Okay, um, so our class human development is 205 is one of the two uh, general education requirements for com communications. So we have students freshman year all the way through senior year uh, who need this class to graduate or it's required for their major. So we have a wide span of uh, students coming in all majors. There isn't any particular major that comes into our class more than others. And this is our first semester flipping the classroom and we went all in. Uh, we flipped the whole thing and we also doubled our numbers of students. So we went from having 112 in a lecture to 200 to, and 240 in a lecture. So we decided just to go big um, all the way this semester. So we've only been doing this now for seven weeks. This is our first time through and we have found some very interesting things along the way. Um, one, we have found that preparing to do a flip is quite a bit of work up front. Um, and during the semester, it definite, definitely frees up some time. So we spent a lot of time over the summer flipping and recording videos and making assignments that they were going to do in class, out of class, in, of cla in class, all of that kind of stuff. But now that we're in the midst of it all, um, we actually have some free time which, during the semester, which is really good. Um, part of that comes from historically this class was taught where students come to lecture twice a week in the big lecture, 112 students, and then they come to a, a smaller discussion for two hours a week with 28 other students. We've gotten rid of those discussions. And so now students are just coming to the lecture two times a week. Um, those lectures are an hour and 50 minutes. So we're with them in the classroom for close to two hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays, or a total of four over the whole week. Um, so they're watching videos before they come in, they're getting all of the course content before they come into the classroom, and then we're doing all application-based stuff in the classroom with them. So we're having them try stuff in their real lives, come back into the class and talk to us about how it went, um, talk to their peers about how it went, get some advice about things that are happening for them, um, but it is all application-based. This class is a communications, effective communication and life skills, probably should have said that at the beginning. Um, but what we're teaching them is how to uh, effectively interact with the world and the people around them. Um, as um, I can't remember down there, he <laughs> very first said that people are going to always be working in teams um, the rest of your life. That is a reality and students often don't like group work. They don't like working with other people. Uh, that is a reality. So we're trying to prepare them for that reality and get them some skills on how they can effectively work with other people. And we believe that that starts with yourself. So everything that we do is about self-awareness and self-management in a group setting. So learning how I operate in some way and how that affects the people around me um, allows me to then make adjustments or do things differently if I need to in order to operate with the people around me. So um, we have found so far it seems to be doing pretty well with our students. They've been watching the videos. We've posted them all on YouTube. Uh, that's how we're getting them to watch them, mostly because we have a little bit more freedom in, with YouTube. And when we go and watch, look at the videos and see how many people have viewed them the day of lecture, there's 300, 400 views. So we know that people are watching them on YouTube. Um, they're coming in when they watch a video, then they also have what we call pre 
face-to-face uh, -face homework that they need to complete and bring with them to class is usually based on the video. So when they come to class, they bring that homework with them. We talk about it. We have them share with us what they've, what they're experiencing, what they're learning. They seem to be doing the home, the that piece of it outside of class. So that part seems to be working. Um, attendance wise, I know that's a big issue or a big question about this, we've had mixed results on the attendance. Um, in our morning section it seems to have declined, and but in our afternoon section it seems to have increased. So we're not really sure what that really means, but that, seem, that is a kind of a, something that we're noticing in the class. So I'm going to let Abby add anything if I miss something. I think you covered most of it. The main thing that we've been um, able to do in our flipped version this semester is add a lot of different learning modalities. So we're doing the voiced over PowerPoint videos, we're doing Tegrity videos, we're using Powtoons, we've used Socrative and done some text-based interaction with students real time in the classroom. And I think that's been kind of our signature part of the flip is that we're not only doing the video content outside of class, the application in class is still meeting them where they're at because they want to be on their tablets or laptops. They still want to have access to their cell phones. And we're using those as teaching tools rather than um, distractors that we have to overcome in the limited time we have now with them in the face-to-face. -face. So that's been really helpful. In terms of um, content interaction, we're still really early on, but one thing that Anna and I were talking about that we've really noticed is that in our morning class, we've noticed that the students tend to have viewed the content beforehand more frequently than our afternoon section and don't have as many questions in face-to-face. -face. But in the afternoon, we have a lower view rate pre-lecture um, but they have more in-class ahas and awareness because we've been doing some pogles and some other um, group-based interactions through our application activities, and that's when the lights really come on. So maybe they only viewed half of the video, but in talking with their peers through the application-based learning, the ahas are almost bigger and stronger. So that's been really interesting for us. All right. <clears throat> Well, it was mentioned about flipping a long time ago, and I'm afraid I'm one of those. Uh, I flipped about two or three years after I got here, which 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the reason I did it was because uh, I, I really just didn't think they were learning in the classroom with this traditional lecture, which is, uh, I think, nowadays is, is pretty well documented. Uh, so, and these were with motivated students. Uh, so what happened was uh, I, I used a, a, a very uh, progressive form of technology for them to, to, to work on outside of class, and it's called a book. <laughs> and back then, they knew how to open a book. Uh, this, this time of uh, the students today, I'm not even sure they know how to buy one. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the result was very uh, promising, and uh, I did it as much as I could, but because of my research, uh, the, it kind of waxed and waned. So uh, my last laser died about a year ago, so I said I gotta find something else to do. So <clears throat> I started uh, using the, the web, and uh, what it bought me <coughs> was uh, some critical time in the, in the class, face to face, which I, I couldn't believe how effective it was and really how much fun it was. It really was a lot of fun. And the difference was that <clears throat> um, I could answer questions that come up in physics because they're trying to solve problems. It's the problem solving that we emphasize. Uh, there's very little me memorization. Um, you know, we heard about mass conservation and things like that and energy conservation. It doesn't take long to get that, but to use it, it really takes time. So that's, that's the major difference. And um, one thing I think uh, we have to emphasize is that if you're going to start doing this, you have to ask, why am I doing this? You really have to know why you want to do this. Uh, we have so much publicity with the MOOCs. And <coughs> I, I have been following this very carefully. And actually, if you're interested, I have uh, I send out uh, 
basically like a blog, the, the uh, articles that are coming out, uh, just email me. It's JTD, JTD at WSU. Uh, I'd be happy to put you on. And uh, the thing that I think we have to be aware of is that there's good and bad in all of this. Uh, there's some things that, that don't work. And uh, one thing that I think we'll probably get during the question period is uh, how effective are these online lectures in terms of do students watch them? Do they, do they really view them carefully? And uh, it's mixed. And what it boils down to is, is what I've heard here, is we, we have <coughs> basically a, you know, sort of a bimodal distribution of motives, ability, background, and so on. And in physics, that's the case. Uh, we have this group at the top that's just fantastic. They'll go on to graduate school. They will make us famous a lot more than our football coaches. And, and th then we have this, this uh, distribution towards the lower end and it, all the way down to people who really shouldn't be physics majors. And a lot of them uh, learn that as the time goes on. The uh, one thing that I have had to concentrate on is the face-to-face -face period. That, those periods, uh, you don't just walk in. Uh, it is true, you have no idea what's going to happen. But you have to have a little bit of structure. And <coughs> the first thing, of course, is answering questions. Um, you have to have some uh, way of getting, probing their understanding. So that there has to be a way to interact in such a way that you probe this. I do know groupies. Physicists don't like groupies. They, they work on their own. Uh, now, occasionally they have to build a bomb or something like that and they form a groupie. But a lot of our, our work really is independent work. And so, you know, we just don't do it. And I'll tell you, frankly, the times I have tried it, it eats up too much time. It takes too much time. So that's why I don't do it. And um, the other thing that I do that's probably a little different is I do demonstrations. And they love that. And what I found is that in the earlier times when I used to do demonstrations, they loved them, but they didn't understand them. They didn't really understand what was going on in terms of the physics. With this small class, oh, by the way, it, uh, what I'm teaching now is a uh, electrodynamics class. It's a junior, senior level. So I've only got like 15 students. And so therefore, I'm the TA. Uh, I'm the person who meets with them uh, for the face-to-face. Uh, -face. In bigger classes, uh, you have TAs or mentors doing this. Mentors, by the way, in physics, are people who couldn't get a job. And so they're doing this as a way to get some income. Nevertheless, you're getting some pretty good people to do that. Are we doing it? No. Uh, WSU in physics is not doing that. But if you go to the majority of places that are using, for example, MOOCs as the lecture part, and then face-to-face -face for the other part, uh, they're using these, these uh, mentors or TAs. Um, the other thing that I find important is that they always have trouble getting certain problems started. And so I'll help them with that. I'll never do the whole problem, but I will get them started on that. And so that's a, that's a big thing. I give a quiz once a week, and I always give them the solutions immediately. And that is very effective, because they have struggled with the problem. Some of them have gotten it, but a lot of them have not. And they, that is an aha moment when you, when you show them how to, how to do it. So the, uh, the uh, other thing that is a little different is I give them one day off. So I only have two sessions uh, per week for the face-to-face. -face. The reason is because the online lectures, which are just uh, voice-over PowerPoints, are extremely intense. They have to go over those things three or four times in order to really get it. And they love the fact that they can restart it, go over it, and that's a big thing. That's a very big thing. Um, in they can email me questions. I, I tell them that, you know, if it's after midnight, forget it. Uh, <laughs> but 
they do email me questions, and if I can, I will, I will answer them uh, pretty much uh, at the moment. So uh, those are some things. I haven't told you everything, but uh, in terms of the response, uh, the grades didn't change at all. Uh, they didn't go up, they didn't go down. Uh, in terms of what I think they've actually learned, I think they've learned more, but it's all anecdotal. Okay, that was great. I think we should give our panelists another round for everybody. Thank you very much. And I think you can definitely see we have a wide variety of, of courses. We've got introductory HD 205 with all kinds of students. We've got more specialized fields. We've got graduate level, um, but techniques that are working throughout them. So now it's time for question and answer. Karen. Question for HD 205 about what room you're teaching in now. I know what room you used to teach in and how students could work together, mm -hmm. but with double enrollment, obviously you don't fit in that room anymore. So how do you physically have group work with 240 students? Well, uh, for the afternoon session, which is the 240, we're in Todd 130, um, which is an interesting room in and of itself. Uh, and when the weather has been uh, agreeable, we've gone outside in the courtyard that's right out there in between Todd and Fulmer. There's that big quad area. We go outside and do some of our um, interactive experiential activities. We've also utilized the space in the room where we do have them move around the room, um, get into small groups based on a row that they're sitting in. And so the rows work together. Um, we've done uh, activities in the hallway and coffee cart area there in the Todd Atrium. So we kind of bend and flex depending on the weather and depending on the attendance on a particular day. We have had days that was lower attendance, so moving was definitely easier. And some of the things that we ask them to do and to interact with one another don't require physical, physical movement. Some of it is just discussion-based if it's Pogel. Um, so only one person would get up and go to the board and write an answer. Some of them have been um, through the Socrative app. So it's texting, and they send it to us, and they see it happening real time on the um, projector. So they don't have to physically move to interact. Would you add anything? No. Darren, do we have any questions? Um, we have one participant asking if we were going to have any workshops um, on designing and setting up flipped classes. Well, as a matter of fact, we are. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll just say briefly, I was going to say this at the end, but we'll, we'll be following this panel. We, we were hoping that this panel would be a kickoff to really inspire and motivate and show people that your peers are doing this on campus. It is doable. Um, we'll have a series, I think, of four workshops uh, coming up two of them really to talk more specifically about different models and designs of flipped classrooms, give you some ideas of how you might do this, to what extent you might want to, you know, deep, jump in the deep end or just wade in the shallow end, and then a couple of workshops that will talk more specifically about the technology and what you might really be looking at, committing yourself to, what are you going to have to learn about. Um, and then in the spring, if you're interested in doing this, the Global Campus will have some workshops where we actually will do some hands-on. We'll give you some advice and get you started narrating PowerPoints or creating your video lectures. And I think we'd be interested in talking about the grant, um, using our expertise to help create those. I know Brian Mackey would love to be creating those amazing videos. He does a lot of that anyway. So yes, there will be a lot of workshops coming up, so keep an eye on that. Will somebody kindly explain what Pogol is? Uh, Pogol is a very structured group work process um, where really the instructor or the teacher or the professor in the room is a facilitator of their learning. So um, generally it's, it starts with um, they're in groups, you put them in groups of, they recommend somewhere between the five and seven students working together. They start off with really basic understanding of things, definitions and things like that, working more down to more critical thinking and application of concepts. Um, and generally the way it kind of structures out, or at least the way that I've seen it structure out is you, in these groups they're working and while they're working as a 
as a teacher, you're walking around answering questions, facilitating their, getting them thinking on a deeper level. So it's not always just about if they have a question, answering their question, but sometimes asking a question back to get them thinking about it. And then uh, once it's kind of gotten to a point where they have a summary or some kind of answer, they write it on the board so that all the other students can also see what the group has come up with. Um, so then you have all of the different answers and the different things on the board and you can use that as another teaching point or another conversation point with the students. There's probably a lot more detail to it than that, um, but that is the kind of the general overview. And there is a workshop on Pogol that's gonna be here at WSU sometime this 25th, month. 25th, 26th, somewhere um, in there. But it's, it's um, definitely more introvert friendly for students, especially in the large classrooms where they don't want to necessarily share in front of 240 students, it's, it's the way for them to wade in and still be able to share their thoughts. Uh, the, the only thing I would add, and, but I don't even remember the roles, but in the original model, the different team members actually are assigned specific roles um, in the groups. Now, I, I don't use that component, so we don't remember, but if you go to the workshop, they will tell you what those roles are. Um, and it, it's another way, I think, also to kind of get students who are reluctant to, to get to be engaged in a group. By assigning them a role, it helps to, you know, again, get that interaction going. I just had a question about, like, due dates or when you give them material. This is for everyone. Like, I mean, certain certain classes you'll have to give it day by day but then other ones you could probably give a full schedule and they all are accessible on angel i guess i don't know i just well, how do you get like anyone can answer this but how do you give out the material so if people want to get ahead or not i haven't changed any of that they still have outcomes the course has objectives there's content that they need to learn there's processes that they need to learn and uh, for both of these courses, the exam grade, well, for the senior course, it's about 40%. For the introductory course, it's about 50 or 60%. But the process is the thing. And as people have said, you may, you may spend an entire day or a week on something relatively completely different than what you were thinking it was going to do, but, you, but they still have time deadlines. They still have things that they need need to do. And you can flex those a little bit depending on the specific situation. But, uh, you're, you know, again, and that's part of the bigger picture. You're not giving up traditional learning. You're not giving up traditional outcomes and things like that. Um, I would just add, for my class, so we do have a syllabus, but I post the lectures in a weekly folder, so they actually don't get the slides until after we've already had that week's class. Does that make sense? So, yeah, so we just put that in folders, but then it is outlined within our syllabus. You know, here's what we'll be learning in the next few weeks, and then here's what we'll be doing in class. We don't use Angel. We find it really opaque for our students, even though they have it in other classes. So we've been using PBWorks extremely successfully. We have a campus edition, and so students can have their own pages and all kinds of other stuff. And um, each week, we, in the schedule, we have objectives. Students will be able to, and then we put the videos underneath that they can watch to meet that objective and the chapters and stuff so that everything they need is really parceled there. Um, and then, so for that, we could also say, and you also have to do this on the Moodle, blah, 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 blah. So, um, but for us, uh, the transparency of PB works and of Moodle for the a different part of the course really makes a difference in how easy it is for students to access and understand how to get places it's much easier because we can decide ourselves how students navigate rather than Angel deciding for us. Uh, I just wanted to comment about students getting ahead. You you, you mentioned that <clears throat> in my scheme, it would be impossible because I create these things just in time. Uh, and believe me, the time it takes uh, is uh, it's enormous. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing, it's much better. It's, it's far much better than the regular lectures that I gave. And how did I find that out? I asked my students, and they all said, oh man, compared to what you did in class, this is <laughs> <laughs> And, and the reason is because as you're making this up, you suddenly realize that, that there's some illogic there. Or you're, if you 
in physics, there's always this problem of, of SIGN signs. You know, if you have <coughs> uh, plus go to minus, and then a minus go to plus, and you really were supposed to stay plus all the time, you get the same answer, right? It worked, but you but you didn't do it right. And so as you're making this up, you realize, oh my gosh, there's a minus here. Where do I get my next minus? And, and you find it. You just do a better job. Yeah, I guess I'm sort of along the lines of what John is doing. When I hand out the initial class syllabus, it has a class schedule where every day for the entire semester is laid out. The readings are laid out. The videos they're supposed to watch are laid out. So they know this from day one in the class. Um, I will say something, sort of follow up on the comment Tom made earlier. Uh, I give a number, I give six quizzes and three hour exams during the semester. Uh, I give the answers out immediately afterward. And I think that's extremely important. It's, it's a learning experience. Uh, the other thing I do is, I said I'm this is the eighth year I think I've been teaching this class now. All of my prior quizzes and all of my prior exams are posted on the course website along with all the solutions. And I tell them, if you want to see what's going to be on the test, look at those. Cause I also tell them, since I wrote up all those tests, I know I'll never put that same problem back on another one. But they are examples. We were just going to add, for HD205, we also do the syllabus. Everything is laid out day one. But on Angel, we only um, open the content a week in advance so that they can't get too far ahead because we don't want them rushing any of the content. We want them to be on point when they're doing the application. So, but once it's available, it remains available and they can review it, go back to it as needed. We also tell them what the final project is, um, week three. So they have almost all semester to be synthesizing, preparing, and thinking about how they want to approach that. I include all the required readings. There, it's going. Uh, I put all the required readings in my syllabi, and then for the students, I have them for an entire year. So between the fall semester and the spring semester, I will have students who request before they go home for Christmas, can we have your syllabus so that we can get the readings so we can start ahead before we come back in the spring? And I will allow them that. If they're doing work during their break, fantastic. Yeah, I don't know that I would add much. It's the same thing. It's all <laughs> laid out. I, I release mine as we go. Once they're up, they're available to students. I guess what I, one thing that I made, might add is just what I, what I say to students is, you know, one way of thinking about this, you know, unusual arrangement that is new to some of you or, um, is, you know, typically you'd be coming to class and I'd be presenting this material to you. And I've been teaching this class for a very long time, so I've developed all of these practice handouts, and they're posted in Angel, and you can work through them on your own, and there are answers at the end. So that stuff has been available. Think about the flipped arrangement as, now I'm giving you what I would present to you in lecture. You can access it at the time that's, you know, works best for you. You can listen to it as many times as you want. Um, and then you get to come to class, and I have all of this stuff ready for you to study in class, basically. To, you know, I, and I'm setting it all up for you, that this is your opportunity. You really need to do that stuff outside of class, because then you get to capitalize on the fact that I'm giving you all of this practice, and I'm laying it out, instead of you having to generate those you know, examples on your own or whatnot, or even you know, what often happens with the practice sheets, at least in my class, is that you post them, they're available to students. Students go, they look at them, they don't try to do them. They go and look at the answers and they're like, oh yeah, that's totally what I would have gotten. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So they confuse what they have this, well, what psychologists call this hindsight bias issue, where once they've seen the answer, they're convinced that that's what they would have gotten. Um, and what you can do in the flipped classroom is by setting it up in a way that they have to work through them and they don't have the answers, is you, you make their learning and in some instances, their lack of learning, conspicuous to them. The ones who think that they've listened to the lecture and they've got it all down, they totally understand it, come in and then you throw some examples at them and they're like, whoa, no, that's 
and they're debating with their group mates about what the answer would be. And, and so to me, that's very effective. That helps them make the distinction between understanding the material and actually learning it. Can you synthesize it? Can you apply it? Can you critique it? You know, those types of things that I think we're all ultimately trying to get our students to. So in HD 205, you've gone from lecture with discussion labs. It seems like you've just pulled what you would have done in discussion lab into the lecture time period. Can you give me a little more detail on that? Yes, exactly right. <laughs> um, we did. So we would have two 75-minute lectures in the old format and then the two-hour discussion for smaller groups of 28. And we would deliver all the content during lecture and then do application-based group learning in the discussion. And so what we've been able to do is move the content into a self-accessed learning space so they can, as was mentioned, go to Angel at a time that suits them as many times as they need to really get the content and then in our face-to-face -face session. And that's one thing that we've um, really intentionally done is refer to it as face-to-face, -face, not lecture. And that's been um, a mental shift for them because they realize we're not lecturing to them. We're face-to-face -face engaging with them. So during our face-to-face -face time, some of the activities we would have done in a 28-person um, setting, We've scaled up. Many of them we've modified. Uh, there's a lot of new application-based learning um, opportunities that we've come up with for them to take the content that, again, they think they understand. And then as they're trying to synthesize it, they go, oh, I never realized that already was in my life. Or I was already communicating that way. Or this was the barrier I was experiencing until they do it with other people and have us in the room to help guide them with that learning process. So it really is guided facilitation. You've broken them in the larger lecture down into smaller groups within that. Okay. Yeah, we do have some small um, groups that they do one, two projects with. And then depending on the face-to-face -face session, sometimes they'll be in groups of three. Sometimes they'll be in groups of 20, um, depending on the activity. So why did you elect to eliminate the small group time periods and keep the large lecture as opposed to doing it the other way around? Uh, that really came down to faculty time. Uh, we have, as, a fac as faculty members, we were in the classroom 11 plus hours a week, which is a lot of time to be in a classroom. And so we were trying to pare down that time that we were face to face with students so that we would have time to do other things, research and writing and all that stuff that we need to do, you know. Um, as faculty members and so that we could also expand opportunities beyond this class. So we're developing some other products um, so that we can teach a lot of these same concepts to new um, populations as well. But I also wanted to add um, from what Abby was saying that we have not taken uh, quote unquote lecture completely out of the face to face. We are. Um, discovering that having some content that they need to know for quizzes and exams delivered in the face-to-face -face is important. Otherwise, they come to face-to-face -to -face thinking they're not going to need to know anything, and why am I really here, and we're just going to do activities and play games the whole time. And so it's really helpful to have some anchoring of there is some content that you need to, that you need to get in this face-to-face -face time as well. Yeah, a couple of uh, comments um, along the along these lines, uh, and I and I hope it's become pretty clear to you that again we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater here, and you know you could talk about you know what you didn't do about research results and about changing grades and things like that, but getting them a realistic sense of what learning is, as everybody has said, engagement. Uh, where now they have a greater um, investment in their learning and that's a lifetime skill that's a real skill and I think just listening to some of the folks here you got again I keep saying this but you got three old white men and a bunch of new people and it's going to be the new people that are it's going to be the new people that are doing this stuff over the years so uh, I would encourage you to co you know to go come to our classes and, and talk to us and things like that and maybe you can get over that activation energy sometimes but you know had we been having this conversation 10 12 years ago there would be a line of people saying this is just all BS 
this is just all party time. They didn't just come. Said, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't come. come. Yeah, they didn't come. Uh, no, <laughs> I, listen, by far, it, it, the majority it, of faculty members think e-learning is not for them, and they don't want anything to do with it, and in fact, it, they have negative uh, feelings about it. So just to be clear, it's not a done deal. Yeah. The last group that will adopt any e-learning will be the graduate course back the ones who are teaching and I, I realize some of you are doing it. I'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> but I think to get over that but I think to help get over that and it, it won't be everything that, that I think there are a lot of good examples out there and Dick brought one up of clickers you know clickers are pretty simple but I've seen that used in a different university to the west of here in their 700 seat auditorium for you know bio whatever and the prof using those things just like you did. Okay, here's reality. <laughs> you know, it's a random generator. And okay, now you can talk. And the whole auditorium is a buzz with, you know, all these conversations. And then boom. And that's a simple thing, but it's extremely effective. So anyway, if you do want more information or uh, some good examples, you know, some of us might even want to come and talk to your department if you want to do that. Because I do think we've got some some good examples here of, of success. Just a few points. Uh, when I started doing this with my students, I uh, requested a few of my faculty peers to come in and help me test drive some of this process. And I sat down and I had them do a quiz with me and it was exceptionally effective. And there are a few faculty members who are still considering maybe changing their approach because sometimes it takes a while to, to make that change, make that decision. But with HD 205, you guys mentioned that you had 11 hours of contact time a week. I had the very same. I had 11 hours. And I went from three or five lab sections, and I was able to decrease that down to three. And then I was still looking at increasing my numbers. So 20 person. Um, and discussion groups to 30 to 40 because the larger groups were actually working better. You know, I've seen the resistance of a lot of the faculty to doing anything new like this. Um, the one thing that I think I would try and sell them on is, I think you've heard from most people here, we're not covering any less of the curriculum than we did. I mean, we're covering everything we used to do I found that it's rejuvenated my teaching. Um, you know, as much as students don't like hearing the same lecture over and over again, as a faculty member, I was getting bored doing the same <laughs> thing over and over again. This is fun. I, mean, I really enjoy doing it. Uh, so if you're thinking, well, there's some resistance, you just have to convince them that it's, it makes teaching a lot more fun. Well, what I want to reiterate is that when you approach people that hear something new, wow, flipped instruction, they're going to go, oh, I don't have time for anything new. But it's not new. Here's, here's concepts of good pedagogy. Are you, doing, are you applying these in your classroom? How? If not, and you need some information about how to apply these, let me know. I have some good ways in my class. It's always a better way to get buy-in from faculty than saying, here's a new thing, you need to do it because we're doing it and the university is supporting it, blah, 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 blah. So really, I don't want to hear flipped instruction again. I want to hear, you know, student-centered resource rich or something like that. Let's come up with a new acronym that stands for the old thing because that's what it is. That there's, there might be resistance out there. Um, Time Magazine, the October 7th issue, was about the class of 2025, and there was an article in there about online learning. And they actually said that the resistance percentage has diminished from 43% to 23% faculty-wide um, in their polled group. And the other thing, um, there was a Nobel laureate, uh, Carl Wieman, um, he did a study on flipped versus traditional learning and he actually found that students that were in an interactive, and I, I emphasize that, an interactive flipped classroom did twice as well as the traditionally taught students of the exact same material. So it is yeah. possible. Those were also, by the way, big classes. Yeah. And so the small groups were TAs or these mentors. So 
it's not the instructor who has to go to, you know, 25 mm -hmm. sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Can I just say that? Yeah. Uh, w one thing that I th I've found um, that has changed is that the, the typical mode of learning is to go to class, really not learn very much, and then cram. Cramming is the, the number one method of learning at most uh, traditional uh, class types. So what you're avoiding with these smaller groups is that you can continue to put them in a situation where if they haven't listened to the lectures, it's, it, they're dead meat. They just can't keep up. They can't do it. So I think that that's an important factor. I, I don't somebody who studies these things can say what cramming versus not cramming does, but I know it's not very effective in terms of long-term uh, learning. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just random thoughts are coming to mind as people are making <laughs> really good um, comments. I just was going to add, you know, we're thinking about kind of feeling like our teaching maybe gets a little stale, teaching the same lecture, and, you know, some of the most exciting moments in the classroom for me when I'm even lecturing is when, you know, that hand pops up and some student has this great question about the material and it's very clear that he or she is listening and thinking about what I'm saying and, and I want to now steer, I want to go to that question and spend, you know, 15 minutes, let's talk about it and let's get everybody else thinking along, along, the, along the same lines, you know, so this student thought of that question but okay, the rest of you consider how the class material relates to this. And of course, then we're all at the same time looking at our clock, at our watches thinking, oh, but if I spend 15 minutes on that, what, how many slides am I going to have to give up? You know, how much is it going to delay me as, as we move forward? So the beautiful thing about the flipped arrangement is you get them to do all that stuff outside of class. They're listening to all that content, and then we get to come into class, and we get to think about all these interesting questions that you have about the material. And push you to think about the material in um, unusual ways. Lots of times they have great questions. I guess I feel like this semester, I, I'm, I like teaching, but flipped has made me even more excited about teaching uh, because this kind of free form lecturing is, is taking the class in so many interesting directions that I wouldn't necessarily have thought of. My students are leading that, that movement, so. Just a short thing, in the College of Education, most of our, or the majority of graduate students in teaching and learning are international students. And they have a completely different tradition, different background of learning. And flipped instruction isn't necessarily what they want, what they think is learning. And they do listen. So we need to consider that students across our classes have different learning styles and that this isn't going to be for everyone the way that you do it for everyone. So there has to be some exceptions sometimes. And the best way to figure out what to do with our students is at the beginning of every semester say who are you and how do you learn and um, what do you expect from this class and then make those adjustments. Not have the whole class kind of laid out ahead of time and saying this is how we're going to do it. That's just as bad as everything we've been doing for the past 100 years, I think. Okay, we had uh, at least one question at least from a distance, and that is, would you be open to having other instructors or faculty sitting in on your class to see how it works? Yeah. And pretty much I'm seeing most people nodding yes. And okay, well, this has been fantastic. We will be doing more workshops on flipped classrooms and using the technology. And um, this also is will be archived, recorded, available on our website, which is teach.wsu.edu. Uh, we have a lot of resources up there for, in general, using technology to teach, not just teaching exclusively online, but using technology to make your teaching more effective and more efficient. Um, we have a blog. Yes. I've, I've been talking to the provost about this whole issue. of I, It's e-learning rather than just flipped. And one of the things that I've been pushing is that these are experiments. We are experimenting. And that's what a university should do. And so I think if you're writing proposals, you might want to push that because it really is important that we have, look at the diversity in the way things are being done here. That's an important thing. And I'll have to admit, that after done it, do doing it a while, I see, oh my God, I got to change this or that. One thing that I had to do 
was shorten those lectures. <laughs> I had some that went an hour or 15 minutes. <laughs> so best people say 10 minutes, I go for about 20. But anyway, it's an experiment. So I, I think that that's an important thing. I would just add that in <coughs> the material that I've been using, again, mainly from the University of Colorado, their video clips are no more than five to eight minutes. You know, and it's, th this generation, if it's more than eight minutes, it's way too long, so. Yeah, that's, yep. yeah. That's what we generally recommend for creating your online lectures. And if you need a longer lecture, you just put it in small pieces and label it really accurately so students know exactly what you're talking about in that piece, and then they can look at the pieces they don't know. Jennifer. When I'm in the classroom doing face-to-face -face time, I like that terminology. I always make sure that if I am lecturing to my students, that it's no more than 10 minutes, preferably the five to eight, because they'll start zoning off and <laughs> getting their phones out, so. So we'll um, email the link to the presentation to all of you. Hopefully you can pass it on to some of your colleagues, and I just think you know, we just need a groundswell. Um, we'll send it to chairs and associate deans and see if we can get people talking about this more and just looking at different ways, like I think what Joy said, is looking at our students and who are they and how are they learning in this day and age and what do we need to do to really promote that learning. So if there's no more last minute comments or questions, I just really want to thank the panelists for giving up your time to do this. It's very much appreciated. And to all of you who've attended and to all of you online who've attended, um, this has been great. It's very exciting. So we hope to do more. <laughs>